Donc, euh, Geoffrey Hall est un chercheur norvégien. Il est euh, en fait euh, chercheur postdoctoral au département of Teacher Education and School Research de l'Université d'Oslo. Il a mené une thèse de doctorat sur euh, l'inspection euh, étatique en Norvège, euh, à propos de la Norvège, donc. et il a publié un certain nombre d'articles et un livre euh, sur la question de l'inspection scolaire en relation notamment avec les questions de loi, donc de, de loi en matière d'éducation. Euh, il a également euh, écrit euh, un livre sur le leadership et les défis au fond posés par la loi et par le problème juridique dans les écoles. Avant d'être chercheur, euh, Geoffrey Hall a été euh, enseignant et il a été aussi directeur adjoint d'une école secondaire en Norvège. Euh, pour le moment, il est un, engagé dans une recherche qui s'appelle Professional Norm, School Leadership and Educational Law, a Comparative Study of Norway and Sweden. Euh, et donc, il est particulièrement intéressé par la question de la mise en œuvre des normes légales. Euh, des questions de normes professionnelles dans les écoles en lien avec toujours les questions d'inspection et de gouvernance du système scolaire et des écoles. Il est également euh, enseignant euh, dans le domaine de la méthodologie et de, de, du leadership éducatif. Et bien, frère, on te remercie euh, euh, de cette conférence qui prend place à l'occasion d'un séjour postdoctoral euh, à la chaire de recherche sur les politiques éducatives. Donc, la parole est à toi et donc la conférence sera en anglais, c'est une introduction en français, mais je pense que tout le monde sera euh, capable de, de suivre la conférence. S'il y a des questions de, de, de compréhension, on pourra y revenir dans, dans, la, dans la période de discussion qui suivra la présentation qui durera 30-40 minutes environ. Merci beaucoup, professeur Morin. Now I'll switch over to English. Uh, thank you for being here today, and I think I'll stand up if that's okay. Um, and thank you for your introduction. Uh, so, as you said, a little bit about my own background before I start. Um, I started out as a, an English teacher about, uh, I can't remember, 1994, 1995. Uh, I taught English, history, and social studies for 17, almost 18 years and the last four years of my, my career in schools, so far at least, uh, was as, an, uh, as a vice principal. Um, and after uh, completing uh, my master's degree in educational leadership, where I now teach, uh, in 2010, I was recruited into higher education. And, uh, and as, as you said, I've, I completed my PhD just about one year ago. So. Uh, and most of the presentation I'll be um, look, uh, most of the presentation today will be looking back at the work I did in my PhD project. Uh, however, towards the end of the presentation, I'll uh, refer to some of the very early, and I have to say very early stages of my, my postdoctoral um, project, which uh, looks at the, the, the link between professional norms, uh, uh, educational leadership, and educational law. So uh, I think I'll start out by introducing some of the, some of the key concepts which I'll be using uh, and present an overview of state school inspection as it plays out in Norway so that you're a bit uh, familiar with the, with the Norwegian context. And, and hopefully some of the overall ideas will be, will be familiar to you and I think so Uh, from looking at your website and knowing the work that you've all done, uh, I, I th I'm sure that a lot of the concepts and references will be, will be uh, quite familiar. Uh, then I will move on and draw to four or maybe five sub-studies that I did as part of my, uh, my research. Um, and through this attempt to give you kind of an overall picture or Um, an overview of how this governing tool, or rather a set of governing tools, I would say, school inspection is, uh, and how it gradually has evolved, especially through the, the past decade. And finally, I'll, I'll conclude and, and uh, try to sum it up and open up for a discussion and, and questions. But however, if you have some questions, uh, 
if you need some explanation, if you could help out with maybe some translations into French, then please, please, please stop me. So um, first I'd like to draw you uh, your attention to a brief outline and, and rationale of the presentation. Uh, as you know, many scholars, among them Christian Marois and uh, the Norwegian scholar Johan Olsen, uh, have pointed out that we're currently moving towards a, a, a post-Weberian state, or possibly um, uh, which, which includes a modernization of bureaucracy, uh, but also, at least in Max Weber's uh, classical terms, authority uh, expressed uh, through objective civil servants. Um, Secondly, uh, and important here, are governing modes, and I'll, I'll come into, I'll talk a lot about governing modes today, uh, also known as configurations. They adjust to, uh, to varying national traditions as well as supranational influences, such as through Europeanization and globalization and, and so forth. Um, Another key concept which I'll be talking about today is governing. And I know that governing can be defined in, in various ways. And from reading up on literature uh, the last four or five years, I, I'm, I'm still confused of, for instance, the difference between governing and governance. And it, it, and it, really, it, it is really frustrating, but I've tried to sort it out for myself, at least. Um, and at least, um, uh, Governing can be, be understood uh, within a heterogeneous public sector. Here drawing on some work uh, by Drelon and Marois from 2007, uh, where policy actors enact as well as interact with each other within bureaucratic contexts, thus developing the institutional bricolage of which they are part of. Another uh, quite common definition of governing, and this is uh, work by Koyman, uh, governing may also be seen as efforts to steer or guide or control, even control society, or at least parts of society. Um, I've been working on these two and, and other um, definitions of governing, but I've, I've in, at least in my thesis I landed on the following uh, definition. Uh, in my understanding, and specifically in the case of, of school inspection, and not only in Norway, but in other contexts as well. Governing refers to how an active state attempts to or, or, or steers processes at subordinate levels within and also across, across institutions. Um, a key characteristic of school inspection policy um, is the development of inspection frameworks. Uh, and such uh, a framework uh, composes more or less, uh, and this is drawing on work by, uh, by Jackie Baxter and others, a framework is uh, the, uh, an infrastructure of rules which highly regulates the inspector's practice. And these are often in form of procedural handbooks, uh, which to some extent, at least, or to a very large extent, um, shapes the way in which they go through the inspection process. Um, however, also, from my understanding, educational, uh, or these frameworks may be viewed as results of attempts to reform education, actually. For example, fo focusing on, which is a big, uh, huge focus in no Norway and has been for at least 10 or 15 years now, attempts to, uh, to, to shape uh, how formative uh, student assessment takes place in schools. However, um, uh, acts of reforming, at least from a, an institutionalist, neo-institutionalist point of view, as Stephen Ball might put it, I'm not sure I would place him within a neo-institutional thinking, but at least from my thinking, uh, does incline more than mere implementation rather involving constant sense-making, interpretation, and renegotiation between the policy actors. And this is uh, referring to a book by uh, Braun, uh, Ball, and Maguire from 2010. 
So uh, just to give you a brief overview of school inspection in the Norwegian context, um, regular state school inspection was introduced in 2006 um, as part of a, a, a national quality assessment system, which today is called a quality assessment system uh, since 2012, uh, where inspection of public and I have to say public, primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary schools are, are, um, are supervised by county governor's offices, or CGOs, and I'll be talking quite a bit about CGOs. Uh, and in Norway, uh, and this, these CGOs are representatives of the state, and in Norway there are, as of now, 17 counties throughout the country. Uh, as of 2019, there will be, uh, this will be, uh, change to uh, 11. Uh, we, have a, we have an ongoing uh, municipal and, and county reform in Norway now, so they're, they're uh, combining both counties and, and municipalities, so the, the number will be declining the next few years. It's been a huge political discussion as well. Nevertheless, um, uh, important to understand also, maybe, is that inspection of private and free schools, and in Norway we don't have a whole lot of private and free schools, at least in, in primary and lower secondary education, there are very few. In upper secondary education or high school, there are, there are, there are more, especially in, in large urban areas and cities. Uh, the, these uh, inspections of these uh, schools are handed directly by the directorate, which, uh, and the directorate is the, the superior to the county governor's office. Uh, they do, they do uh, collaborate quite, quite a lot. However, there is a, there is a, um, a distance in, in the hierarchy between them, at least. Uh, the main purpose of, uh, of inspection is to control uh, legal compliance. And if, at the same time, I would say, evaluate school districts and school routines for ensuring students' individual rights. And this is an area which I've been increasingly interested in, uh, how or at least to which extent school inspection can see to that students' individual rights uh, are, are, uh, are uh, respected at the school level. Um, interesting also, inspection reports are published online. They're openly accessed. Uh, there's not a whole lot of debate, I would say, around these reports at all on the local level, which is maybe a bit surprising, at least compared to, for instance, the neighboring country of Sweden, uh, where inspection reports receive more interest from the public than the cases in Norway. Um, this, the recent framework uh, now, uh, in the recent framework, the focus is on, among other areas, uh, student learning outcomes. And as I said, student learning outcomes here does not mean formal grading, but means, for instance, uh, formative assessment uh, procedures and, and practices in schools. Uh, another term might be, I know there's a difference, but might be assessment for learning. Um, also, uh, something that I've, I've looked at and, and important to understand here is that there has been quite a shift in con configuration of policy tools. And at least since 2006, there have been four in all four uh, handbooks. Uh, and these uh, have, uh, in addition to handbooks, the inspection or the inspectors use templates or rubrics, uh, more or less fixed. Uh, also, schools have to supply uh, self-evaluation. And another, and maybe interesting, at least from a student point of view, is that now they also ask students uh, through surveys in the schools, how, for instance, how does your teacher in, for instance, for instance science and English, how do they uh, carry out these discussions or uh, when it comes to form and assessment in, on, in various subject areas. Um, at the same time, I would, at least towards the end of uh, the uh, presentation today, look at 
uh, or ask, at least pose the question, if school inspection now is possibly uh, moving towards a more performative approach. However, at the same time, I, I need to stress that uh, the, the inspectors do not actually go into the classrooms and observe classroom instruction. And I'm sure that there might be a long way until we, they actually do that in Norway, at least. Um, so then, uh, next year, uh, a new framework will be, uh, will be published or, or activated or possibly enacted. And, and as of now, I'm not sure how that will move, but uh, possibly status quo, meaning that they'll uphold the, the areas of focus that they, they have had now, but there, there might be some, some shifts. At least for me, that will be very interesting to see sometime next year that will be uh, uh, public. So to sum up uh, some of the main points uh, as of now, uh, there have been shifts in school inspection policy, uh, not only the last 10 years, but at least back to, and I failed to mention that, that there's been a, quite a tradition of school inspection in Norway, at least back to 1860. Uh, back then, the, the system was very different, and I don't have time to talk about it today, but um, back then, at least, they were into schools and observed classroom, classroom uh, instruction or, or teaching. Um, these shifts, shifts in school inspection policy, at least since 2006, have been influenced by, as I said, in, uh, international tendencies and influences, but also nas national traditions. Uh, I've also pointed out reforming may be seen as processes of enactment, meaning that actors involve influence upon the shaping of school inspection policy and practice. And through this, they actively, at least in my understanding, my point, from my point of view, they actively contribute to current and also future practices of school inspection on the regional and, and local levels. So uh, now I'd like to draw uh, your attention to a selection of empirical studies, uh, which together sh hopefully at least should highlight some of the shifts of Norwegian school inspection. Uh, the first study I'll talk a bit about is, uh, is the one I started out uh, in my, in my uh, PhD, and that was to do uh, a comparative analysis of, of legal statutes and uh, policy documents. Uh, across Norway and Sweden to look at how is state school inspection from an analytical and theoretical point of view, how, is it, how are they uh, configured in the documents. And in the, the study we asked two key questions. Uh, first, how can the current inspection policy, at least at the time, be described in view of parallel uh, changes made in Sweden? And secondly, how do the inspection policies of these two countries combine different modes of governing? The analysis uh, drew, drew on both historical methods and sociological comparative methods. Uh, here are a couple of the references. Uh, however, according to, to Taylor, uh, 1997, there is no single recipe for policy analysis and certainly not in comparative studies. And I know many of you do comparative studies. You might agree, you might disagree. Uh, moreover, policy and, and policy documents are highly contextualized, I think, and partly depend on the context in which they originate from. And another uh, reference here is Rui uh, from 2007. So then, uh, in order to facilitate an analysis over time and across two contexts, the Norwegian and the Swedish. We drew on both historical methods of inquiry as well as sociological and comparative methods. Um, in historical studies, uh, and this is from uh, a Norwegian historian Kjellstali in Oslo, he says that uh, normative sources such as archives or official documents, also the law, may be uh, viewed as either being, for instance, evaluative, uh, look, meaning how things should have been, or on the other hand, purposive, meaning how things should be or how things were. The first 
is in, uh, in uh, retrospect, and the second is more or less focusing on projecting a uh, future idea of, in this case, school inspection. So based on these two um, historical understandings of normative sources in combination with sociological theory of the post-bureaucratic state, we at least attempted to develop, I think we, we, uh, we, uh, we succeeded pretty well, uh, at least from my understanding, uh, a, a fourfold analytical mod model which we used in the study. Uh, and we also used Envivo to, to code these, uh, these documents. Uh, through reading the doc documents, um, the initial analysis uh, after the first reading, uh, uh, a t typology of four specific modes of governing arose, two of them being purposive, which I just talked about, two of them being evaluative. These modes of governing, or possibly functions, uh, another thing we can discuss, are the typology we used in order to evaluate these uh, 23 documents across two countries. And in all, references to state school inspection uh, were identified in the material, 8,830 references were, were, uh, were identified in the material and were categorized uh, using in vivo. Uh, so we looked both, we did both a content analysis, but also we counted up uh, frequencies of utterances in the material and, and, and um, compared them. Uh, to make it a bit more clear or m clear possibly, uh, we established uh, descriptors for each of the four modes of governing and then we searched the documents to find relevant utterances uh, concerning state school inspection using the keywords describing each of the respective four modes of governing. And here we see this in the, in the third column uh, in table one, which you see here. Uh, so there are two purposive, uh, two evaluative. Uh, the, purposive uh, the purposive legal mode of governing looked at uh, terms or utterances which expressed, for instance, control, examination, compliancy, or compliance, and regulation. The purposive professional mode expressed help, support, withdrawal, and information. Uh, on the other hand, there were two evaluative um, modes in the material, looking at first what was done, meaning evaluation, achievement of targets, quality assessment standards and guidelines. And then finally, the pragmatic approach uh, or pragmatic mode of governing, uh, encouraging or at least expressing development guidance, counseling, cooperation, learning, and dialogue. So then, um, there are two main findings in the study, uh, and if you're interested, you could you could uh, have a look at the uh, the the paper if you want to. Um, even if the cases of public administration s seem to be at least outside of the Scandinavian context to be homogenous from the outside, uh, there are there is substantial evidence evidence in the analysis of major differences in the inspection policies in these two countries. Um, and secondly, and this is just very brief, the Norwegians, Norwegian documents uh, in conclusion portray, portray to a larger extent in the Swedish case legal and pragmatic modes of governing, <coughs> while the Swedish documents emphasize to a greater extent uh, the uh, professional and expert defined modes alongside uh, legal proposiveness. So in the um, second study, uh, which I'd like to highlight today, uh, interviews, uh, I conducted the interviews. With, uh, I was in a research team with several other researchers um, within uh, the, the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Education. Uh, we carried out interviews with several, uh, I think 50, but somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, interviews with officials and also uh, school leaders and some teachers in three of the counties in Norway. Um, 
more specifically, at least in this study, uh, the, the study included data from a sample of interviews with school inspectors and, uh, and their leaders, the, which are called county education directors. And uh, the focus was twofold. First, uh, I looked at how the professional roles of the inspectors are evolving due to new expectations and new forms of accountability. And secondly, I wanted to, to investigate how the inspectors possibly contribute to the developing of these roles since this was in a shifting policy environment. Uh, very briefly, and this is probably familiar to you, uh, theoretically the, the study draws on uh, institutional theory, such as conveyed by, among others, DiMaggio and Powell, and also Richard Scott. And in the study, there were, uh, in this part of the study, uh, there were two, first two key concepts, and that were institutions and institutionalization. Uh, there are many, there are many, uh, there are many um, definitions of institutionalization. Uh, another one is by Zucker, uh, has done some interesting work. Uh, however, here institutionalization refers to what Philip Zelsnick and Richard Scott, and this is Scott uh, referring to Zelsnick, uh, defined as certain processes happening to an organization over time and reflecting the organization's history and development as well as the people within it. Secondly, uh, I studied the, I, I, I wanted to study the CGOs more at the micro level uh, and I'll, afterwards I'll get to an observational study where I was able to follow one of these teams which I interviewed in the second study. Uh, I wanted, as I said, I wanted to study them more at the micro level where new expectations and forms of accountability uh, and a changing policy context play a key role. Uh, and, and a, an important reference here for me was uh, what Scott, Richard Scott refers to as binding expectations. In addition to institutional change, which together are the two other main points of focus in, in, in this paper. Um, for me, uh, school inspectors are seen as institutional agents, meaning that they actively construct, they interpret and construct the institutions in which they maneuver in their everyday work. However, in the, in, in the brief time I have today, maybe we can get back to it in the discussion. I'll, I'll not go into more into the theoretical footing of, of this study. Um, now then, who are the school inspectors that we, we interviewed? Well, um, in, as I said, there were more than 50 informants in the, in the interview part of the study. We, I, we also did a survey. I, I don't have time to get into that. but. Um, in my, my sample, three of the informants are trained lawyers and five are educators and previous school leaders. And one has, in the material, has a background both from the teaching uh, profession and, and he, he is also an economist, a trained economist. Uh, and this is quite normal in, in Norway. Most of the school inspectors are either previous educators or school leaders and the other half, more or less, are, are lawyers or have, have a legal background. Interesting though, the lawyers who are recruited as school inspectors very seldom have an expertise, specific expertise in their training within the area of education. And it's very, very hard for them to recruit people within specific knowledge, legal knowledge of education. Uh, and in average, they have uh, about six years of experience in, uh, in the, as, as inspectors. Uh, from reading uh, the, the transcripts of the interview material, uh, there were four, and this is drawing on the theoretical uh, framework, there were three, or four, sorry, four key dimensions uh, which arose from, from the reading and the, and the analysis. One was institutional change and new expectations. Second was inter-institutional dependency, meaning how uh, the county governors, uh, for instance, uh, collaborated with other, other uh, areas of, of uh, public, uh, public service, public uh, bureaucracy, and also uh, intra-institutional dependency, meaning how did they work within the, the individual CGOs, for instance, between the lawyers, educators, uh, 
between the lawyers, educators, and their leaders, and so on. And, and finally, uh, also, I was interested in looking at the role of the past, present, and, and future of school inspection and, and their professional roles. Uh, now I'll, I'll give you some examples uh, from the, um, from the uh, interview material. And these, these are also in the, in the study as well. This is, uh, the first one is uh, Sophie, who was interviewed uh, here about institutional change and new expectations. Uh, and the educator, uh, she was an educator, previous educator. Uh, she told this about new expectations uh, in the interview. She says the following, but these instructions, it does mean that there is a quite tight regime then you have to find and form that leeway without breaking instructions and without surpassing what is understood as clear guidelines. Trying to find that leeway is not always easy because you are supposed to be loyal towards the guidelines, but the possible leeway you have might be as easy as changing the wording. When it comes to inter institutional dependency and cooperation, uh, we also interviewed Harold, who is a director in what we called CGO West in the study. She's, he says this about interinstitutional dependency and cooperation. I can't say much about the division of labor between the ministry and the director because I don't know a whole lot about it. But in any case, concerning the division of labor between the directorate and the CGOs, Cooperation is very good. I don't think it has all, always been like that. Because I hear it from those who have been here longer. That's, that it's a new way of working and a whole new attitude towards our input. Uh, this is uh, the lawyer from CGO North in the northern part of Norway. Uh, we call him Jens. He said this about the negotiations taking place between the two professions, the lawyer and the educator. Well, I think that we complement each other very well when it works out as well as it does. So it could be that sometimes if the educator wants to be the lawyer and the opposite, it may be quickly be like a challenge. But if everyone uses a role a bit consciously, then I think it can turn out well. We do have an economist which we need sometimes. But I think we mostly complement each other, yes, but with an increase in inspections, then it's clear that educators have to be kind of hobby lawyers. So they quickly become influenced by our way of thinking, which may be a bit opposed to their pedagogical hearts. And finally, in the material, I'd like to highlight this excerpt, uh, and this is Eva. Uh, She's also an edu a previous educator. Uh, they were interviewed about the changing inspector role. And she said this about the previous way of carrying out inspection way back in, in, in 2006. With the method we started out using in 2006, we were very concerned about which hat we were wearing. If it was the inspectoral hat or the advisory hat. And it was actually wrong to bring an advisory hat back then with us out on inspection because it wasn't supposed to be like that. We were very careful not to mix roles. So uh, to highlight a few of the key findings um, in this study, interview study, the role of school inspection and inspectors is changing. That was not surprising. However, for me at least, it was a moving target to study, and which, which was quite difficult but also, uh, also interesting. Uh, and in the material, we, we can see that processes of legal deliberation, interpretation are considered as challenge, challenging by the inspectors and their leaders. Not only the lawyers, but also the educators. The inspectors feel a greater sense of dependency, positively speaking, at least, than previously, especially the link to the directorate, their superiors, has improved. However, I would say from a critical point of view, they are in many ways at the same time less autonomous now than before. They are brought in to collaborate with the directorate. However, they are to a greater extent 
uh, at least from my point of view, they are more steered by the directorate than previously, even though they do, do have more hearsay. They don't actually, in the material, um, acknowledge that. Um, also important, inspectioning uh, includes more sources of data, such as school self-evaluation than before. And this is parallel to many shifts and changes in many other places in the world. Uh, inspection is also very resource demanding and challenging, especially for the schools who have to document their routines and practices. And the inspectors told me several times that the schools often furnish more documentation than necessary. They actually send in loads and loads of, of paper and PDFs to the inspectors before the inspection process in order to sufficiently document their practice. They're afraid to not document enough, but they actually receive more than they need. So it's a, it's a big job of sorting out ahead of the, the inspection process. Uh, third, um, I'd like to uh, move over to uh, an observation study, which was the, the, the third and final paper that I, I did in my thesis, where I had the possibility to shadow 13 meetings between inspectors and their leaders, as well as teachers in three municipalities. And uh, some of the inspectors which I followed here are from the interview material as well. So I got to know the inspectors quite well after a while. Um, as uh, Marwa and others have pointed out, modes of, of uh, soft governing have or may have at least uh, clear implications in how school leaders and teachers experience the inspection process and other forms of accountability tools or, or tools of governing. Um, schools are now prone to more performative I would, approaches by the inspectors and are in many ways held accountable towards what takes place in the school, not only according to the documentation, but also based on interviews with students, more interviews with several uh, forms of leaders in schools, middle leaders, not only the school principal, but also the department heads, the assistant heads, and so on, and also individual teachers. Uh, and. These results, as I said previously, they, they end up in a report. They're published online. Uh, what, I, uh, what I wish to highlight in this study specifically was to demonstrate how the templates, the rubrics that the inspectors use, how they, how they steer the discussions between the, the inspectors and those who were inspected. Sorry. So the aim uh, of this paper was to elaborate on how the use of templates represents a new way of steering, normatively guiding schools in the right direction towards the future. And the research question in the paper uh, is how does governing by templates, as I called it, represent a major shift or change in inspectoral policy and practice in Norway? As a conceptual starting point, I drew on first on Christopher Hood's typology of governing tools uh, in two books, one in 1983 and then in a later publication in 2007, where he reflected upon his 1983 book. Uh, and in, uh, through these governing tools, uh, governments, in his thinking, uh, control society through use of a toolkit influencing the lives of its citizens by applying a set of administrative tools to suit a variety of purposes. As a second conceptual uh, stance or starting point, through the enactment of education policy in general and more specifically in regards to state inspection policy, these actors are seen as in interpreters and must thus understand and also enact centrally initiated guidelines and legal statutes and policy documents. And this is drawing on the, among others, the, the work by Brown, Maguire, and Ball. <clears throat> uh, this is a, it might be hard to see, but this is an overview of the observation sites and participants and the data 
included in the observation study. Uh, I w as I said, I went into three schools with three separate inspection teams. Some of the teams had the same members, but the configurations or the, the, uh, the, the teams itself, they were a bit different from time to time. And I was also given access to all, the, all, the, all of the pre and post inspection documents, the reports, the, the pre-report, all this self-school evaluation and so on. Which gave me, uh, I think, a pretty good overview of what actually took place in the inspection process. Um, the two examples I'll be using today uh, are from a group meeting first with English teachers at a lower secondary school as well as a closing meeting at an elementary school. And I, I have to mention that these schools and all of the schools uh, the, that I looked at were, were inspections of public schools. Uh, this is from a group interview with uh, three English teachers where the inspectors are asking questions about a student survey administered to the students prior to the inspection visit as well as which routines the school had regarding student assessment, especially uh, formative assessment. They are, however, asked questions about f formal grading as well for some reason. I'm not sure why. Anyway, um, and this is uh, Inspector One, the, the educator uh, asking questions to uh, William and Mary, uh, two of the English, English teachers. The inspector says, over to self-school evaluation, are there any reflect uh, sorry, reflections concerning the students' responses. All feedback is in ITL, which is an LMS, in addition to orally in the classroom. Encouraging feedback in, for example, science gets a lower score in the survey, for example, than in English. William says the distinctness of each subject. English is maybe more concrete than science. Now, over to more on assessment. Is there a deadline for grading? It's in the teacher's activity plan on, on the uh, LMS. Do you have a template for student-teacher conversations? Yes, but I don't have it with me. Moving on to question 14 in the student survey, assessment for learning. There are lots of good examples of good practice. We are, however, wondering about the reading development forms and the Carlston test, which is a reading speed test. Mary says it's written down somewhere and the, the teachers start looking at each other quite insecure. And here we see, and this is, gives one good example of how the inspectors rapidly move through their questions using a rubric, which very, very, to a large extent, steers how they ask the questions. And these templates are also used in the final report, reporting, which comes online. And they're not really, I would say, engaging in, a, in an actual dialogue with the teachers. Maybe it has to do with time, time resources, and so on. Maybe something else, I'm not sure. Uh, in the second example, uh, and this is in, in uh, an elementary school, uh, where they don't have formal grading. I, I should mention that in Norway, grading starts in year eight. So in lower secondary school, formal grading starts. So in, in elementary schools, they use formative assessment. Uh, and this is uh, the inspection team here is presenting a preliminary inspection report to the leadership at a closing meeting. And at the meeting also the, the municipal educational director is present. Um, and this is inspector three who was a lawyer and inspector one an educator. And Inspector one is the same in, as in the, the previous example that I, that I showed you. Here, inspector three says, the next point is assessment for learning. We have observed that you have routines for midterm assessment. So this is covered well. You also have routines for, and this is a bit unclear. So that is a concern. On background of the student responses, we conclude that this isn't good enough. Principal Jones says, so you probably understand that we don't really agree. Inspector says, really? Principal says, I mean that the student survey isn't really sufficient. I would actually claim that there, are some, that there is something here which is incorrect. This doesn't make sense, and therefore I don't, don't agree with the numbers. 
really. And moving on, this is a, the educator says, the survey does include something which is not here. It concerns different questions which are not included in the summary. When we have chosen to land on a no, meaning that the schools are not within the law, it is due to the fact that your response, your responses in the self-evaluation compared to the feedback from the student themselves in questions five and six concerning their particip participation in their own work process. Therefore, we think that you are on track, but still not good enough. What do you think we should do, says the principal? The inspector says that the teachers become more aware of this, so there is not a whole lot that you have to do. Here we also see examples of a school principal attempting to engage in a dialogue, an actual, I would say, learning dialogue with the inspectors without really succeeding. And this is another example of how these templates or rubrics, they rigidly steer interaction in all steps of the inspection process. In the interviews, in the uh, pre-inspection uh, documentation, and also in the reporting. Uh, so some of the key findings in this third study, the observation study, uh, I, I would conclude with uh, that the inspectors are clearly engaged in evaluating the school's routines for following up on policy and regulation. However, there is reason to question what I've called the one-size-fits-all approach to inspection, where there is very little room for actual dialogue between the actors involved. And third, schools, school leaders, and teachers are subject to a system where they, to little extent, I would say, receive necessary report uh, sorry, support and guidance. Since the system is more geared towards moving through the checkout line, as I've called it, rather than using time allocated to help them out to become better interpreters of the law. Uh, here, and I'm this is the, the final study that I'll be presenting before I, I sum up today's presentation. We're moving into my, my uh, very early stage of my postdoc project, which looks closer at the link between educational law, professional norms, and, and school leadership. In the Education Act, there are three overarching legal principles. First, adaptive education. Secondly, inclusive education. And third, and which is central in this presentation, uh, and also in the book chapter that I'm referring to, equality in classroom instruction. Uh, in quality in education, according to the state curriculum in Norway, and we have a centralized state cur curriculum called the Knowledge Promotion, which has been since 2006. Educa uh, uh, equality means education which takes into account that all students are different and must therefore there must therefore be ample room for adaptation towards students' aptitudes, backgrounds, individual needs, etc. Uh, from my point of view, I think that the, the state curriculum has a different understanding of, of equality in education that, that, than I do, and I'll, I'll get back to what I mean. Um, so what I'm trying to focus on in, in this study or the book chapter is that the, uh, look at the extent or question at least in which state school inspection can be used as, as a tool to ensure possibly equality in classroom instruction. I'm not sure the term I landed on in the English translation classroom uh, instruction means teaching, but in, at least in an American since there's more, more talk of, of uh, classroom instruction, you would not, in, in the Norwegian context, actually use instruction. Mm -hmm. I think instruction and teaching are two separate things. Um, important also in this context, uh, and this is something uh, which I, I worked on in a project with, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, uh, a range of other uh, researchers, both in law and education. We looked at juridification of education. Um, and there's a fact, and this is not only in Norway, but also in other Scandinavian contexts, and I'm sure uh, 
outside of Scandinavian talk context as well. Uh, school leaders and schools and teachers are, are really prone to a system which is increasingly affected by the law, by juridification. And this implies that practitioners, they have to relate to more focus on legal demands from authorities, from parents and so on, maybe lawyers as well, and, te and uh, not only, uh, and are to, uh, however, very little formally trained in, in uh, the legal aspects of education, which I think might be uh, something which is lacking in, in teacher education and in, in leadership education, at least in, in Norway. However, um, at the same time, I would, I would like to point out that there is ample leeway within the law for legal discretion within the boundaries of the law, meaning that the law is not something that is very square, it is more or less round and the boundaries can be expanded. Um, and there are, we, we've also done some studies, uh, not this study, but other studies showing that um, school leaders very often, they, they do the right thing when it comes to law and education, but they're not always sure why they do it. They can't actually relate directly to, to uh, legal statutes and regulation. Um, through the enactment of the current inspection framework, there is little focus on supportive modes of governing. Even this is actually encouraged in several places in, in state or central policy. When it, in, for instance, in white papers, and, and one important white paper in this study is uh, one from 2013 called On the Right Track. However, that was under the, the former, uh, the former uh, labor uh, uh, Labour Party government, and now we have a Conservative government, so I see that some of the poly policy has changed a bit. Uh, we'll see in the new, in the new um, handbook, which will be out next year, if there's been any, any, anyone who has looked at this white paper, which encourages supportive, uh, more supportive modes of governing. Um, and a question to raise here, I think, is if there are sufficient resources allocated to make room for such an approach, because this is time consuming uh, and the inspectors use a lot of time, resources to prepare for the inspection, to carry out the inspection, and also, of course, to write up the report. So an inspection process, even though they're in the schools only for two days or maybe three days, the whole inspection process might go over three months. So a lot of time and resources, and of course, public uh, f funding is used to, to carry out school inspection. Uh, however, I think one positive aspect is, um, let's see. One positive aspect is that there's been an increase, I think, it's positive at least, something I discuss, use of student surveys as, as one form of, of, of self-evaluation, uh, giving, from my point of view, student voice more, more space in the, in the policy processes. And support for this may be found in, for instance, the UN Declaration for Children's Rights from 1989, which is also part of the Norwegian Constitution today. Uh, to conclude this final study before moving on to summing up, uh, I wish to point out the following. Um, the main task in school, I think, not only inspection but also in schools today, and this is not only in Norway but worldwide, is to ensure equal opportunities for all students, and I'm, I'm sure we can agree on that. However, in order to meet these challenges, the forthcoming renewed inspection framework should possibly incorporate more supportive modes of governing. And maybe this implies a reallocation of the resources used in today's system. As of today, the county governor's offices who carry out school inspection, they have difficulties recruiting enough lawyers to go into the offices. And one reason being that education law is not really top priority in the law faculties uh, in Norwegian universities. And this, however, might be a bit changing, I, I'm happy to say, as we're in also right now currently trying to establish the first permanent research unit uh, 
and courses in educational law in, in Norway, and I think the second in Scandinavia. There's one in Uppsala in Sweden, and we're trying to hopefully replicate the success that they've had, because I think this is really important to give teachers in all areas, all types of schooling, and also educators and others a good insight into how educational law is not only challenging, but also is a helpful tool to make them understand uh, their professional practices as educators and leaders. Uh, however, I think it's important to, to point out that um, compliance control nevertheless is still necessary to ensure certain legal standards in all schools. Uh, to sum up, uh, in three points, Norwegian school inspection has undergone considerable change since 2006. The current framework, as of now, is, has moved closer to the classroom level, is not into classrooms yet. Um, and the system is still evolving and constantly adjusting to the need of, to combine control of legal practice as well as the ambition to offer support to school authorities and school leaders and teachers. So in a system where schools need more support and a framework leaves little room for such supportive interaction, there is reason to claim, I think, that there is quite of a mismatch between governing modes, between policy and, and practice. And I'd like to just show you, uh, emphasize one of my, possibly my favorite quote from all the material that I looked at the last five years which I've analyzed, and this is uh, from Heidi, uh, who's an educator and inspector from the northern part of Norway. And she says this about the new role as school inspector. The greatest challenge is to get municipalities to understand that we are not trying to catch them with their pants down. We are aiming to at helping them keep their pants up. So, thank you. Thank you Or you can switch and we can or we can I don't know get through it. Who wants to, to put the first question? Um, yeah, maybe I will go. Uh, thank you, Dietrich, for, for this presentation. Um, when I first uh, read your, 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 your presentation, the summary of your presentation, it made, made me think about school evaluation, school set evaluation system in uh, Scotland. Mm. But as soon as you were presenting, uh, I uh, understood that it was quite different, uh, mostly because of the lack of maybe uh, mesure or instrument to help to um, schools to develop and to work on their processes and uh, management processes and uh, educational processes. And but uh, I would like to know if. In your point of view, is there any influence from the, this accountability system in Scotland, in, um, in Norway, but also uh, regarding the lack of uh, any, any school improvement development uh, system in school, uh, is there any, you, you, you were talking about the, the, the closing meeting, I assume it's uh, the feedback the school and principal receive from the school inspection. And um, do they have any feedback about their, their school ins inspection? But also, is there any follow-up after the, the school in mm. inspection? For example, uh, in Scotland, they have to school, uh, have to work on school development plan, for example. Is there any, any, any tool like that in Norway? Uh, how head teachers are working with the, the results of school inspection and uh, with the teacher and so on? Those are several very good questions, and I'm, I'm glad you asked them, because um, Norway has, in many ways, attempted to learn from Scotland. And uh, that we have data, not in my studies, uh, but I've uh, read other studies uh, showing, for instance, studies done in Edinburgh by Satira Grek and others, showing that, uh, that uh, state school inspectors in Norway have actually been in Scotland on several occasions, and other places in Sweden, for some reason in England, 
and other places to, to learn from other policy contexts. Um, I would say, as of now, uh, if you read that being said, as of now, um, you would find support for such an approach in policy, not within the law, but at least in state policy. However, there have been certain shifts uh, politically as well. Um, so there's support in policy uh, over time to allocate resources more towards supporting schools and helping them develop their legal possibilities of their pedagogical practices. Um, and also, if you, when reading the handbook, we've also analyzed, uh, especially the, the latest handbook, we've analyzed it quite closely, me and, and, and others as well. Um, there are places there encouraging such an approach. So for instance, you mentioned the, the feedback at the closing meeting, uh, and this was, this was some, one example. Um, at the closing meeting, the inspectors present a preliminary report. Uh, the preliminary report is only preliminary, meaning that the schools can actually, and we saw an example of this, the principal trying to question what was actually in the report, questioning the tool or the instrument that they use, the student survey and the results of it. Um, I don't think, at least in this material, that the, the, the principal succeeded in the dialogue. However, uh, and, but the, the inspectors, they make note of the, the feedback from the schools. Um, they can also not only do that in the meetings, but also uh, in writing afterwards, after the meeting. And then in the end, the uh, and I, I've had a look at some of the final, final inspection reports, comparing them to the preliminary reports, and there are some changes, but more or less they're, they're, they're the same. Um, in the final reports, though, there are some recommendations made by the inspectorates. And I think that's, that's interesting, uh, because if you look back at, say, 2006 or 2008, reporting there, there were there, wasn't, there weren't many recommendations from the inspectors to the schools on how they could possibly improve their practices when it comes to assessment for learning or, or uh, teaching. They don't really look at teaching, but th there is some focus on teaching nevertheless. Um, so there's a, that's why I, raise, I try to raise the question if there is actually uh, if the, the resources which are allocated, if they're actually used in the right way, or could they possibly use dif be used differently? Um, by reading also in, in policy and also in the, uh, looking at the interview material, the observation material, um, and reading the, the, um, the most recent handbook, which is, I think, about 130 pages long, Quite, quite extensive. Uh, you will find traces in there uh, saying that the report should be, should be read by the municipalities, by the schools, the school leaders and teachers, that schools who have experienced inspection should teach other schools or use their knowledge to inform other schools of how they also can improve their practices. That's something which I haven't looked at. That I think, but uh, um, we have some survey data on it, uh, but I haven't specific look, specifically uh, looked at that. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, regulation and also the handbooks uh, say something about uh, that the inspectors should try to at least come back to the municipalities and, and try to encourage them in a meeting uh, together with other municipalities, other schools, and, and uh, to try to learn from each other, from, from each other's experiences. Um, but at least based on the interviews that we did and the observations that, that, I, that I did, 
uh, and from reading the policy documents and so forth, uh, that doesn't really take place to a large extent as of now. And it has to do with the resources. There isn't really enough resources out there to carry out, I think, such uh, uh, a more learning, learning uh, mode of governing, you could say. So that's, I don't know if that answers some of your questions. But there are some resemblances between the, the Scottish and Norwegian <coughs> system, but I think the Norwegian system is, is moving possibly towards that, but that is yet to be seen. Another point that is striking uh, in your presentation is that you, you emphasize the role of law, the role of the rights, the civil rights, but you didn't mention at all um, the role of targets in, in the Norwegian system or the use by inspector of uh, statistical data. Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, related to the reality of the Norwegian uh, inspection or is it in your presentation that you emphasize the role of law and uh, the relation uh, to the law and to the legal frustration uh, from, from, mm. from the, mm. the principle? Mm. So could you touch upon? I think, um, from my understanding, well, I, I've looked more, more at the function of the law mm -hmm. and not so much as, for instance, which targets are met or not met by schools and mm -hmm. how the inspectors in the schools might discuss them. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, in Norway ha they have mandatory national testing on several levels in schools, in reading, in writing, and in Arithmetic, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not basis for, for the inspection. Okay, not at all. Not at all. However, when asking inspectors, and we have data on this as well, when asking inspectors how do they find out which schools to go into and mm -hmm. inspect, I think that's a very important question. Uh, and they say that, well, we have a risk management system, meaning that we we look at also, uh, not results, but different types of statistics which may point us in the right direction of which schools we should go into. Um, also, uh, and, and I looked mostly, I looked at, uh, at the regular state school inspection. Mm -hmm. um, the, the county governor's offices, they also um, handle complaint cases from students for instance, uh, who, yeah, for instance, they complain about their, their final grading. Uh, the complaint, the formal complaint is sent through the school to the county governor's office and handled there and sent back. Uh, that's not part of the in inspection process. They also uh, not only look at complaint cases and, and carry out regular state inspection, but they also uh, I'm not sure of the number, but maybe somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of their time is used towards uh, what is called um, self-initiated inspections. Meaning that there might be schools out there for some reason, and it's been in the media, there have been some schools who where uh, very tragic cases, cases where, uh, where students have, have, uh, have, uh, have died because of lack of follow-up when it comes to, um, to, uh, to bullying in schools. There have been some, several cases, very tragic recent cases. Uh, and in these cases, the inspectors have gone into schools and looked at the systems, not only in the school in question, but also across the municipality. So those are, I don't know if it's really answering your question, but the inspectors don't only carry out um, regular inspections, but they're also, their time is allocated for other, other tasks as well. Um, and and I, for me, what, what is in behind 
the, um, the rationale of risk management. Uh, for me, that is really a fuzzy, a, a fuzzy uh, configuration, what is in there. It's a fuzzy term. Because I didn't, in the interviews and in the observations, I didn't really get a clear picture of what they put into the, the term risk management. Um, um, but it could be schools, one thing they did mention, however, in the material is that there could be schools which over time have had one or more substandard uh, results on the inspection reports. And therefore, there might be reason to go back to these schools, specific schools, and have another look at them again and see if they might have improved. Mm -hmm. but, but in the end, statistics and numbers are not... I mean, the schools do, of course, um, furnish these numbers. And they're open, they're open on the net as well. So results on national tests, for instance, they're open on the net. Anyone can go into and and compare schools in municipalities across municipalities. So it's not really a question of not, not the numbers are, are there, but they're not used actively in, in the inspection process. Okay. Mm. Sure, but it could mean something maybe on the general political uh, culture. If you know even maybe that we live in mm. a uh, country. Mm. What is striking to me is that you know, there, there is a difference between economic liberalism and political liberalism. And one of the main uh, difference is liberal, uh, political liberalism put the emphasis on the rights, uh, the, the rights of uh, the citizen and the rights of the children should, should be uh, respected. And economic liberalism put the emphasis on utility mm. or efficacy. Hmm. general efficacy. And in North America and in Quebec in particular, all the, there is no inspection in Quebec, for example. They, they removed inspection 30 years ago, about 30 years ago. But there is uh, uh, quite a very real uh, accountability system on targets and on performance, so a performative system of accountability, mm. which is maybe related to this uh, general uh, political climate, uh, emphasizing uh, uh, the, the general efficacy of policy on the society, on the school system, on the health system. Mm. And this is striking that in no way the, 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 the legal uh, size of inspection is very, very important. And it is. in this legal infra framework, the rights of the student, uh, the, 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 for, for example, the role of the student survey in the dialogue, the mm. learning dialogue that you present, is a basis of, uh, uh, of the, 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 the diagnose of the inspection. There is more. It could be also the case in, in, in Quebec, but the, I don't know if the students' rights are as important here compared with the, 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 the result. Mm -hmm. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if mm -hmm. the general c political culture could be modeled. In, in mm -hmm. Well, I think in in general, the the. Uh, the focus in Norway and 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 uh, and in in all of Scandinavia, at least in Sweden as well, is a, a large focus on what you called political liberalism. Mm -hmm. However, in as as you might know, there is there is more focus in Sweden, for instance, on the economic side of school inspection, mm -hmm. and there the inspectors are more used as as educative uh, supporters, but also controllers in schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, within school development and so on. Uh -huh. uh, I think um, the general, my, my impression in Norway is that school leaders and municipalities in school still have quite an, an autonomous role in education. Meaning that as long as they stay within the more or less boundaries of the law, then they can more or less uh, carry out teaching, learning, assessment, 
evaluation as they, as they wish to. However, there are differences within Norway as well. I mean, if you asked a, a, a school principal in the capital, capital city of Oslo, there is another political climate, you might call a regime, to be a bit critical, uh -huh. than in other places in Norway. Okay. Uh, so the, there is, an, the, there is an, uh, an, an urban dimension there as well when it comes to accountability mechanisms. Uh, for instance, in Oslo, they also have a separate Oslo test where, they t in addition to national testing, they, they test, they, they do additional testing of students. And these are very much used, uh, for instance, in discussions between uh, educational directors on the municipal level and school principals. And in some cases, uh, and this is a bit controversial, I know there are some studies done in Norway as well, uh, school principals' salaries might be set according to, to, results. to results. This is not official, but we do have studies more or less showing that. It, it, it's still controversial. Um, but from a research point of view, it does happen, yes. and uh, help us uh, understand a little bit what's going on in, uh, in different countries like Norway and, uh, and Sweden in the comparison. Also, uh, the, the, the methodology you use was very interesting to, to understand the move, like the change in, 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 the, in the regulation system. So, uh, my question was, uh, I would like to know what do inspectors uh, uh, emphasize about the, the uh, professional autonomy in the, in, the, in the context of that of that move uh, towards it, like, like legal regulation, do they do they mention something about it, or do your do your results uh, identify these kind of, uh, kind of uh, feelings? Or well, um, if I if I could answer that from a educational leadership point of view, I would say that being a school leader, especially a school principal. In Norway and, of course, other countries, is very demanding. And in Norway, school principals, uh, we, there are some studies on that. They some some studies which have counted the number of law and and types of regulation which school principals have to relate to. And I think the number has surpassed 400. And school principals, I mean, we have to acknowledge they are still uh, educators. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be, but in general, there are educators, at least in uh, lower secondary and in primary schools. Uh, and as I, as I talked about, they don't have very much formal legal education or training, which I think is something which up to now is lacking within teacher education and leadership education. We do have courses in it, and I know other places have courses in educational leadership. Um, I've also, I've also done some courses for, for, uh, for teachers' unions in, in Norway as well. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge need out there for, for these, these people to um, get a better sense of understanding of, of the law and also what you can do within the law and what you can't. Um, when it comes to professional autonomy, I, I think also when it comes, well, well, in school inspection, the inspectors do acknowledge that, that educators, school principals, and municipalities, they do make mistakes. Uh, so it's not like if you get a bad result on a school inspection report that you lose your job or that schools will be closed, which comparably has taken place in Sweden, at least in private schools where schools, at least private schools, are closed as a result, among other things, of bad or substandard inspection reports. Uh, but professional autonomy, both with, among leaders and teachers uh, in Norway, has, uh, has a very, is very strong, I would say. I'm not sure always that, of course, depending on who you ask. Uh, if you ask the teachers' unions, they would say, no, this. There is autonomy, but it's uh, 
And I, and I saw a quite recent, the, the leader of the, the largest teacher union in Norway, which uh, I think has more than 100,000 members, maybe 150,000, said uh, in, there was a recent survey done by the teachers union saying that I think one third of all teachers felt that they were steered too harshly, which, which uh, possibly says something about the, the uh, autonomy context. But in general, teacher autonomy is quite, quite, quite large, quite substantial in Norway, and also for leaders. So it's. Um, so the fact that there is this juridification process in Norway doesn't mean that the professional autonomy principle is reducing. Because how do you explain? Because it's a paradox. It is. It is. On the other hand, and this might be outside of my, my field of research, but from a general point of view, uh -huh. and as a former school leader and teacher, I would say that um, if you take away, at least in the Norwegian context, if you take away professional autonomy, then who is going to apply for a leadership job? I know that in other, and, and, and even still Norway is a very, you could say, soft accountability context, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least in general. And I mentioned Oslo as possibly a more, uh, a harder accountability system than in, than in general in Norway and, and, and other large or medium large cities as well. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to recognize the fact that if you, in a policy context, tighten the screws, then I think there will be a huge, even larger uh, challenge to recruit the right people into those jobs. And I think I read somewhere, and that is in a totally different context, but at least in England, I read somewhere uh, um, a study saying that uh, at least 25% of all school principal jobs in England are vacant. How much? 25%. Even though pay, even though pay is high, comparably, and I've, mm -hmm. I mean, up to surpassing 100,000 British pounds per year as a school leader, even though it's difficult to recruit. Mm -hmm. and, but of course, the accountability system is different. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, very much more performative. Yeah. So. Um, but, but, but from my point of view, uh, and bringing in the, the performative um, concept into Norwegian education, um, by asking school leaders and specifically teachers direct questions of how they carry out assessment with their students, mm -hmm. and asking students at the same time, do you agree? and compare what the teachers and leaders say with what the students say, I think that's moving towards a more performative system, yeah. even though it's not counting, even though it's not governing by numbers, to use that term, it's still a form of performance. Yeah, of course. Uh, and in the material I see that, uh, well, leaders and teachers, they find this challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but, but nevertheless, it's, uh, I would say it's, uh, I think there's room there for a learning climate among the inspectors mm -hmm. and schools and school leaders and municipalities. But um, I think there's need to look at how the resources are used, maybe in a more supportive manner. That might, that might mean more money into it. However, that, but, but there, there might be different ways of conducting inspection than it is conducted or has been at least the last 10 or 12 years. But I'm not sure. I don't have any answer, so. I do have, one. <clears throat> I, I have two questions, but um, you did answer a little bit my first question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, you said that um, the current fr framework, 2013 2017, is moving closer to the classroom re re level. What do you think of the next uh, framework? Do, do you think, how much closer do you think we will get into the classroom? and? What would be the effects of that new framework? That was actually my first question, but yeah, that's a very good question. Um, 
I wish I could, I wish I could answer you, give you a really good answer there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to see. Uh, but I've in uh, in the uh, the article or the the book chapter that I referred to. I looked at I compared um, um, two white papers, one from 2013 and one from 2016. Uh, nevertheless, in two opposite or different political climates, one being uh, social democratic, labor led the other being conservative-led, which we have now in Norway. So the political con contexts are different over time. But looking at how the policy in 2013 speaks about or projects school inspection with the one from 2016, uh, I have to say I was uh, a bit puzzled that, that changes in school inspection or in the forthcoming uh, framework weren't really out there. They weren't really uh, spoken about. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I, I had the question there, status quo, question mark. I, I think mm -hmm. as of now there will be a continuance towards uh, what has been up till now. Um, Oh, that's a that's a difficult. Sorry, I you. Maybe you were going. To it's difficult to answer, but um, I think I think the the clim the climate is. I think time is there to look at. I mean, after ten to twelve years, moving towards what we've had uh, up to now, uh, I think maybe there's time to look at how could this these resources be used mm -hmm. differently. Because I mean, it's it's public funding, and I think we have to be quite critical towards what public funding is used. In, uh, in an accountability system. Okay. So I, I don't really have a good answer, but I, well, I'm uh, hopefully, and this is maybe without the re research or the context, but hopefully they've had a look at some of the most recent research done on it, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe they've discussed that it could be changed or, 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 or done in a different manner. And my second, second question, well, thank you for this answer. That, that's a very good, good answer as well. Um, why do you think a lot of <coughs> people do not really debate on inspection reports? Um, well, uh, to answer that, I, um, as I said, I've, I've uh, or uh, as you, in your introduction, uh, I've, I've also done some teaching in when I was a PhD student and, and recently as well. Uh, and I've also done courses in, in, uh, in education leadership and, and uh, legal aspects at a couple of other institutions as well. Um, and when talking about inspection, I, either it's in, in, uh, in Oslo or in the Oslo region or in other more rural areas, I, I ask the students, uh, who are mostly either school leaders or teachers, I asked them, have you ever seen an inspection report which has debated in the local press? And I've, up to now, I've only, I think only on one account I can remember that uh, a student has said, yes, it was actually, maybe not on the front of the local newspaper, but was in it there somewhere, that, uh, that there were some uh, some discrepancies in the report that were discussed in the local media. Uh, if you compare that to Sweden, which uh, the, the climate there, the interest from the media is, is much greater. And I'm not sure why, uh, it, uh, why uh, in general, there hasn't been a whole lot of debate over inspection reports. Uh, I think inspection in that manner, uh, not possibly not the, the regular form of inspection, which is the, what they use most of their, their time on. But the, uh, the self-initiated inspection, uh, part of the CGO's uh, tasks, I think that's, that shows that it's, uh, there is room there to, to use resources towards possible um, 
well, things that happen in schools which are, which are, not, which are not good for students. Meaning that there, there might be, as I mentioned, there have been cases where, where students have, have uh, to, be, to be blunt, committed suicide because of lack of support uh, uh, in relation to bullying. And therefore, I think the school inspection has a, has a very good, um, a very good role, an important role in society to control and also support schools to, to improve their routines. And I think the routines are there, but they're not always known by all the staff in the school because, you know, staff change and teachers come in and out and um, so, um, yeah. <clears throat> Other question, actually, like you talked about the school self evaluation. Yeah, uh, maybe I missed something during the presentation. But I, what I want to know is how 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 does it work actually? So I know in uh, like in the context in Senegal, for example, it's uh, an inspector that build the, the evaluation and uh, handle them to the to uh, to schools, you know, and then they they give them bad results. Or Kind of the, the summary of it. Mm. How it works in, in Norway? Well, the, uh, that's, a, that's also a very good question. I th and I th think there's an, uh, this is in many ways similar to what takes place in other, other contexts, meaning that the inspector, the school in, inspectors, they, sent, they, they send a, a formal letter to the school saying that in six weeks or eight weeks, we'll be in there for two or three days, we'll be asking questions, uh, we'll be interviewing uh, staff and, and leadership. Uh, however, we want you to please document the following and they will, they will be given a list of things that they want documented uh, in the school self-evaluation. One of them is a student survey that I mentioned, so that they will be given a survey beforehand, they'd administer the survey and the results will go back to the, the school inspectors. So that's one example. A second example uh, would be to document uh, which procedures they have for school, for uh, sorry, for uh, um, formative assessment in the schools. Not only relating to the law, which prescribes that all students that that um, that formative assessment must take place in all subjects over time, and there must be discussions between subject teachers and students. At least, I think it's still once per year. Um, but also, they need written documentation of how that, how what documentation, what procedures uh, is known throughout the school. And they would uh, use that self evaluation to prepare themselves for the inspection visit, and write up a, what they call an interview guide. So there would be questions relating to where they would look at. The documentation of the school and compare that to what the what the the student responses in the surveys uh, would be. So, but but as I said, uh, schools tend to document much more than they have to, uh, which must be must be very time consuming for for teachers and leaders in schools. But maybe the, the guidelines are, are not clear at the, at the, from the beginning. <clears throat> that's why they they give more than. Maybe. Maybe uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think okay. we are just uh, time is over. Mm. So mm. We, we, I would like to thank you again, uh, Jeff, for this very interesting presentation and this general uh, presentation of the, the Norway Norwegian context also. So I'm sure there there are other questions. Maybe we we will have to put this question to, to Jeff. So thank you very much again. And thank you very much for your questions. Thank you.